<laughs> I've never had that before. Got it. <laughs> All right. Ready to go? Yes. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Scott, and the reason we are all gathered here today um, is ultimately to have a conversation about um, with our arts community and talk about how that intersects with sexual violence. And so this month is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and um, we are doing programming and webinars uh, throughout the month just to give everyone kind of a snippet of one, what Family Support Center does. Uh, we are a domestic violence, sexual assault, um, human trafficking, child abuse, elder abuse um, advocacy agency, and we provide free services and confidential services to individuals who have experienced any plethora of interpersonal violence. And so um, the reason why we're all gathered here today is to really um, work from the understanding of that all forms of oppression. So this includes uh, racism, heterosexism, transphobia, ableism, um, et cetera, all intersect with sexual violence. And so the question is, is more like, it's not just how can we eliminate sexual abuse and harassment within our arts spaces or in our spaces and community in general, but um, how do we, how do we as um, cultivate safe and supportive context where art is created, performed, or even engaged with. And so uh, with that, I will pass it on to our facilitator, Shane. I thank you so much, Ka. Um, so I just want to introduce myself a little bit to those who do not know who I am. So I'm a social worker, but more importantly, I am a people person. I really like people probably more than most people do. Uh, I'm the host and founder of the Social Exchange Project, which is a podcast here in Eau Claire that's aimed to elevate people in arts, which is essentially the topic that, of discussion tonight, education and also social impact and social activism. I'm a very proud Hmong American woman who's really intentional about highlighting my own community as well as all marginalized communities. So I'm really glad to be here. Thank you all so much for allowing me to facilitate this conversation and for being here as well. So uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists. We'll start with uh, Ga, of course, first, because she's obviously the one who produced this episode along with the Family Support Center. Um, so Ga is a queer Hmong woman. Uh, born and raised in Eau Claire, she received her bachelor's in, uh, a, a, in at the UW of uh, Eau Claire and commissioned as an officer in the military in 2017, and then graduated with her master's in student affairs at uh, UW La Crosse in 2021. The focus of her work was on supporting and uplifting student voices and leadership and disrupting harm in higher education, which often stifles creativity and imagination. In 2020, she competed in and was named one of the top 10 in America's Best College Poets competition. Uh, she currently works as a sexual assault victim advocate at the Family Support Center and a military victim advocate for the Wisconsin Army National Guard. Her greatest passions are creating space for radical anger, and I love that, and audacious hope through writing and spoken word poetry. So welcoming panelist Scott to this discussion. Thanks for being here and producing this whole episode. <laughs> okay, and then we will go um, to Colin. So Colin Ryan is one of the co-founders of Clearwater Comedy. I also think he's the king of comedy. Fight me if you disagree, but he is absolutely hilarious. Um, he's the station manager at Converge Radio. For the last eight years in town, he's been producing live events throughout the Chippewa Valley. Um, that's actually how I got to know Colin was I attended like probably 98% of the events that he booked. Uh, he was also the first comedian to ever perform on the main stage at the Pablo Center. Hi, Colin. Thank you Hi. for being here. Yeah, so glad to be here. Yeah. And then uh, aside from that stuff, kind of surrounding the arts, uh, just as kind of like a little bit of background on me. I spent about 10 years as a uh, group home manager for people with disabilities. And I spent six years as a, uh, uh, in a different, a bunch of different, uh, wore a bunch of different hats, but essentially my biggest one was, I was an employment counselor uh, for the homeless. And of course, of course, there's a lot of intersectionality there, uh, working with a lot of uh, at-risk populations and people with disabilities. So that's kind of where my experience has come out of uh, professionally, so. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yep. Okay. And then we have Jake Lindgren. Uh, so Jake is, did I say your last name correctly? Yeah. No? 
Okay. Yep. <laughs> so Jake is um, an Eau Claire native and graduate of UW Eau Claire with a comprehensive theater degree. In 2013, he founded the Eau Claire based theater company Downstage Left. Through the company, he directs intimate pieces that explore the grayer areas of life. In 2016, Jake joined local New York Times bestseller author Michael Perry to bring Perry's beloved book, Population 485, to life by directing it on stage and touring Wisconsin through 2018. Volume 1 then brought him on board to direct 2019's True North at the Pablo. Uh, Jake has also directed for the Chippewa Valley Theater Guild. So thank you so much for being here, Jake. Thank you. And I also, um, going uh, following a note from Ka, uh, am, am gay and part of the queer community as well. So I think that's pretty relevant to the conversation. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, uh, I just attended one of her shows a couple weeks ago and I'm still, my mind's still blown. Uh, but Jerica Miguel is an Americana singer songwriter born and raised in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. She's released two studio albums and is currently working on her third. Jerica's music has been played on the radio stations across the country as well as locally on WPR Sim Simply Folk and Converge Radio. With an insatiable love of music, Jerica shared this passion through hosting her own radio show on Converge Radio called Tunes from the Womb, in which she played uh, women, queer, BIPOC-centric tunes to help us navigate through these unique times we're living in. Her passion have always been social justice and understanding the human experience through all arts. Welcoming to the show also is Jerica. Hello, thank you everybody. Also proud to be a queer person, non-binary, but she, they pronouns work for me. Excited to have this conversation with everybody, get thoughts about our arts community too. So I'm excited. Yeah, I want this to be really conversational as well. Like some of us know each other pretty well. And um, obviously I've met just a few of you tonight, but I've been following your work and know a little bit about you. Um, so the overall theme tonight is how do we create safety, accessibility and inclusion to reject cultures of violence in arts communities and model this for a broader community. So obviously a very simple, not at all complex situation <laughs> um, or topic to, to tackle, but um, I do wanna talk a little bit, Jerrica, you talked about pronouns. I wanna just make sure that we're getting all of this correctly. I want everyone to just kind of maybe go around and uh, maybe I'll call on you and talk about your pronouns, share your pronouns, uh, the nature of your work, which I know you, you've you already done a little bit, um, what you do and what experiences you bring into this space and this conversation. Um, so we'll start with Jerrica. Um, so yes, yeah, she, they pronouns for me. Um, what I do, I've, I've always loved music and movies too. Film and music have been my main loves in this life. And um, uh, you want me to talk about why I'm relevant in this conversation? Yeah, I mean, okay. I think just the experiences or the lens that you bring, um, yeah. it can be a little bit about your work, but I think it's just important to just like, talk about the experiences you bring into this conversation in this space. Yeah. The main things that I'm constantly studying and focusing on is inequalities. And, and in the music world, I'm, I focused on my radio show, Tunes from the Womb, the inequalities that played out in the music industry, whether you were a woman, whether you were uh, of color, and whether you are in the queer spectrum in any capacity. So I have a passion to learn about that and to bring forth the artists that tend to be pushed aside and made invisible. And so I've always been very intrigued by by that. And as a queer person myself, I have felt invisible my entire music career, um, feeling that possibly me being queer and being a woman has been to my, uh, not helped me gain any success in this industry. So I do have, I have lots of thoughts on that. And um, yeah, and then film too, if we talk about film, the Me Too movement, I was following that pretty hard as well. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, and then we'll go to Ka. All right. So yes, my pronouns are she, her, um, and the nature of my work is all over the place. I would say I'm not a part of any coalitions or collectives, but I do. I am a 
intense consumer of um, zines. And so that's my life. Um, but what I do mostly is like fiction, spoken word, and then narratives, um, like collections of essays and stuff. That's mainly what I do. Um, I feel really outranked in this conversation just because I'm a huge consumer, but not so much a creator, but you know what, going to give myself props where I can. Um, but I think I focus a lot on in my art, specifically my identity as a queer Hmong woman. I think the visibility piece when it comes to being queer specifically is really, really important to me. And it's not something that I um, enjoy having erased as a part of my identity because it took me a long time to get here. And my goal ultimately with my art is to like be visibly and unapologetically myself um, and radically love myself in ways that I am not supposed to be, um, especially with the identities that I hold. And so um, there's that piece that I think I hold really, really close to me, especially when it comes to my spoken word, because I mean, it's like a part of myself that I put into the work that I do that I hope in the long run speaks to individuals who also hold the identities that I hold um, in some way, shape or form. And so, yeah, that's like where I come from and everything, so. I love that, thank you. And I also am more of a consumer than a creator as well. And I still think a level of consuming is understanding how people are creating and that in itself is creative. So thank you for being here. And then we'll go to Jake. Uh, so question. yeah, I'm he, him. And um, so yeah, I've been in theater my whole life, um, performing, dancing, choreographing, singing, what have you. Costume design was a huge part of my uh, education as well. And for a while there, a trajectory I was going to follow until I found directing. Um, and so now that I, I direct I get um, get to really pick the shows and kind of set the direction of, of what I want to do, um, I'm really drawn to, like it said in my bio, the grayer aspects of life. So I don't ever seek out shows that are like wrapped up with a bow at the end and everyone goes home and they're happy and go about their day. Um, I love the idea of exploring characters and like dynamics and characters or relationships where an audience member likes a character but it or identifies with them but is mad at them or disappointed or hates them but agrees with them because that's really hard right like that's that's not easy to to sit with yourself in no matter what the situation is um, and then I also just in very intentional in my script, um, choosing to find really small casts. I love to work with like one to five people. And if they never leave stage, then even better. <laughs> Cause I like to just sit in it. Like, I love that idea of, of the actors getting to really explore and dig in instead of like two minutes on and then they leave and then they come back half an hour later and like, you don't really get to play around and then the audience really has to sit in it as well. So um, yeah, I like to really just delve in and explore those stories of, of people who have a point of view you don't think about or maybe are forgotten or maybe is just misunderstood. So thank you. Me. All right, Colin, you got to follow up that now. <laughs> I, yeah, thanks. I'm very glad that I went last so I can prove just how little I deserve to be here. <laughs> oh, whatever. No, that's not true at all. No, but I mean, just such eloquent, wonderful people that I'm just kind of in awe of. So, all right, uh, he, him pronouns. And uh, I, I, I guess, um, uh, oh, there's so much to unpack here, but I, I guess I'll just kind of start here. When, when I was... Uh, I grew up in a, like a very, very small town, like 1,100 people and nine miles outside of it. Uh, and my parents were, you know, kind of like blue dog Kennedy style progressives, but didn't really understand kind of the intersectional issues surrounding race and gender and things like that. They understood class, but the other parts were just kind of like lost uh, on me in, in kind of a one tone sort of city. and. Uh, when I, when I went to university, uh, my second semester, uh, I ended up going to a 
at the time they called it the gay straight alliance uh like showing of a film that one of the university professors had been in and uh, there had been talk and chatter before this meeting that uh there was a guy when when the event was being promoted in the student center there was a guy who came up to the students and said well i'm coming to the event with a gun and uh halfway through the event that guy showed up and sat in the back and started acting all weird and so at one point the facilitator yelled out everybody out everybody out everybody out and nobody knew what was going on and so we all just kind of ran out it turns out he stood up to like start proselytizing and saying some stuff he didn't have a gun everybody was safe but I looked around at that point in time and I saw all these people that were the same age as me uh, going through something I didn't understand and uh, kind of realizing that that was my fight too. That it was insane that anybody had to go through that. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it was really powerful. And you know, the rest of my life has just kind of been learning how to, how to be a better person, understand other people's point of view. And when it comes to comedy, that's one of the most fun things about comedy, uh, learning what other people's lives are like and getting to laugh about it. it. It's such a nice way to meet somebody new. And that's always kind of been my, my theory and philosophy in booking comedy. I want unique voices because those unique voices are more interesting. And uh, so it, it, it's, it's always a work in progress. I mean, Running comedy shows is really difficult because I, I know that I, I don't want to get too in the weeds about the conversations about cancel culture and wokeness and comedy, which are just so boring and make me so sad because I don't think cancel culture really exists. And I think complaining about wokeness is pretty much the dumbest thing you could ever complain about because really all it amounts to is like, can we be more polite to each other? That's literally all it is. <laughs> so. The, these there have been plenty of mistakes that I've made along the way that I hope I've learned from, and uh, but yeah, it, it's about representation because representation makes the stories better and makes the shows better. It just does. And I would agree with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're you've, you're kind of talking about it already, but like one of the questions to that is being proposed is, when did you first identify that arts were in this, you know, obviously for you, Colin, comedy was something that you wanted to invest in and that you wanted to contribute to, um, you know, in, in that, in that. So I'll, I'll actually start with you, Colin, since you're already kind of talking a little bit about it. And you know what, sure. I'm just going to have it be open to everyone. I'm probably not just going to call in people unless I need to, but just conversationally chime in whenever. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I when we would have rain days at school, I would perform stand up comedy routines that I'd seen on TV in like third grade. It's been something I've always wanted to do. I didn't actually get the nerve to do it until 2009. I moved to Eau Claire in 2012 and uh, just started going to an open mic. And the more people who showed up, the more unique they were, the better it was. Um, I don't know. And I, I guess the reason I got to start booking and producing shows is just because there was enough of an interest in town to let me start doing it. <laughs> uh, Clearwater Comedy is kind of a collective of comedians. We're not really a professional organization. We just kind of like get in from, and, and we give like 100% of the money we make to the comedians. Um, we had a really th good thing going there. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Uh, we had a really good thing going there for a while because we had such a good relationship with the Plus downtown, but because of COVID that closed. Uh, we, we've kept going and found a new partner in the Brick House that kind of is doing the same thing, just not telling us what to book, lets us do whatever we want, which is the first and most important thing that no, no book, no uh, venue gets to tell me what to do or us what to do. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, just kind of go from there. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I definitely, yeah, like I, I kind of said before, uh, booking people from all different backgrounds, uh, racial gender uh um class uh, age you know like you know at one of the funniest shows i've ever seen was with a 70 year old woman that uh, headlining it was one of the funniest things i've ever seen um yeah i i i, I think i'm kind of lost here where where what was i supposed to be talking about <laughs> <laughs> it's okay yeah. no i like going down these rabbit holes because it's like i feel like i get to learn more about who you are colin but oh, okay. uh, the question was like when did you first identify that comedy as an art form is something you were invested in and why did you want to contribute to it uh because laughter is 
because because laughter is my favorite form of love and love is the most powerful force in the universe done <laughs> i should have just said that yeah. <laughs> does anybody else want to chime in um i can go uh, i i yeah. entered music i think back in 2000 i was like 24 so 2000 something five six four um I'm 40 now and I've been doing it ever since. Before that, I was a baseball player. I thought I was gonna be the first woman to play in men's professional baseball. And I did, I pursued that dream and I probably would have pursued music earlier, but I was legit trying to be a, a real baseball player. And I literally was living my childhood dream. But then music, somehow I had enough rhythm. Actually, I was just a show off. So that's why I got on the stage, to be honest. <laughs> My sister Elizabeth was up there. I was like, no, why is everyone looking at her? How do I get that happen to me? So I joined her band and um, we played as three sisters, Elizabeth Jarris and I with Queen Elizabeth for like 10 years. And then I, they were kind of getting done and I was just getting started. I discovered a guitar fell in love, learned how to play it on my own. And I became a singer songwriter and I'm still doing that now. So that's how I entered the arts. <laughs> I just want to say too, that I didn't get to officially meet Elizabeth at your show, but she was sitting next to me. Yeah, And you can tell how close you both are because your love for music. And I mean, I wish I would have been able to hear her sing with you as well but yeah that's a really cool story thanks for sharing that you're welcome you will get a chance to hear her sing don't worry <laughs> i guess i can go um but the question is like when did i first identify arts as something i wanted to do um i think so in high school i was in theater and i loved that like it one, I think same as Jerrica, I love being the center of attention. Um, I just would, I love attention and um, being in theater like allowed me to do that. Like I enjoyed it and I loved it. And while I was there, I always knew and felt that there were not any roles for me because all of the shows that we did were about typically like white men or like white women and their, their problems and stuff. And I was like, I got bigger I was gonna say a bad word, but I have bigger things to worry about and bigger things that um, like I would like to talk about than just these problems that are occurring interpersonally between people. Institutionally, there are so many things that are going on in the world. And I was like, I can write a better play than that. And so I didn't write any plays uh, because I don't know how to do that. But um, I like read books and I was like, you know what, I think I don't see myself reflected here. I didn't see it reflected when I was in theater. I didn't see it reflected when I was reading books. And so I was like, I'm gonna combine the two, I suppose, and do spoken words somehow magically. Um, I started with writing like fan fiction. And then I was like, no, I think it needs to come from my voice. Um, and so in college, um, when I was at UW Eau Claire, I started dabbling a little bit with like, one, I was really, when I talk about like radical anger and like harnessing that, I mean, like when you are in, um, when, ugh, I don't even know how to explain it, but like when you are in the moment where you are so upset and angry at not just the world, but how people around you are being treated and how you are being treated um, and put into boxes that you don't necessarily subscribe to, I think there's a form of anger but also like disappointment and also like sadness that you are not being seen as the person you want to be and through this sadness and through kind of like this hope as well I started writing like I remember this moment where I was sitting in my dorm room and I was just tears streaming down my face but also writing just the most amazing stuff ever about like what does it mean to live in the body that I live in um, and what does it mean to also like see myself from the outside? And so that's kind of where it started. Um, and I performed when I was in college, but then also I performed at like open mics when I was at um, in my master's program in lacrosse. And that was where I found like my true community of like people, one, I'm getting attention. I love open mics. Um, and two, I was just like, these people are listening and they're also hearing who I am at the core of my being with 
the words that came out of this head. And that feels good. That feels validating. And it feels like I not only exist to like survive this world, I exist to really like navigate it and also like shine and also like just completely like shut the entire thing down because um, I'm not here to like be quiet and silent. I'm really here to just really instigate and push buttons. Um, and I enjoy doing that with the art that I do. Um, and I also believe it's completely healing to be able to put things into words. There are so many things that I have written that has never seen the light of day because of the fact that, you know, simply putting it out means something. It means something to me. Um, it doesn't have to mean anything to anyone else. And so that's kind of where it started. It's where it's going. And here I am. Um, yeah, so I was a very shy, um, very blonde headed little boy. Um, and then in second grade, um, we were going to do a little class play called the sky is falling. And the teacher was like, it was like full on volunteer, um, what roles. And then it was, you know, the last was left was Henny Penny. And she's like, who wants to do it? And I was like, kind of I have like it was so nothing I had ever done and I was like I kind of want to do that and we I remember we performed for the third graders so a year older than us and then the only thing I really remember about it is there was a um, construction paper acorn taped to a wiffle ball that is what hit me in the head as the sky falling and um, I was hooked from then like I was like okay that that's a glove that fits and um yeah, and just kind of did it. Like did forensics in middle school, did theater in high school, did show choir and, and choir and all that kind of stuff. And in late middle school made the conscious um, decision to quit basketball and, and go into to artistic stuff, um, which was a huge deal um, being now 6'10", but at the time I was 6'7", I think, um, in a small basketball community that created a lot of waves. Um, uh, but then, so I went on to college to perform, to pursue theater, but I didn't did a lot of community theater, but through all of that, it just kind of was like something I did, like I didn't really put thought into it. I was good and people liked me and I was tall and I could dance and it was cute and it was fun. Um, but then in, um, spring of 2006, I had an AVM, which is in the family of brain aneurysm, and I was paralyzed on my left side of my body. And therefore, like, I could no longer do like what I had been spending my whole life doing, which was performing and dancing and, and doing all that stuff. Um, and the only reason I bring that up was that was kind of then, like, I had a year, full on year at home in recovery. And then, like, I was like, now what am I going to do? Like, I was going to school for theater and I was a very physical person. And now I like I kind of am learning how to walk, but I'm not going to go on stage like that. What am I going to do? Uh, and so, but that's what for me was like forced me to decide how important it was to me. And I was like, no, I am an artist. Like I need to be an artist. I need to be in the arts. I need to figure out how I'm going to make this theater thing work. Um, went to Minneapolis, did um, purely fell in my lap, um, was in a rock opera show um, in 2007. And the group of us who put that on um, formed a theater company that was actually really successful for four years before half of us went to New York and then not including myself. That's when I moved back to Eau Claire to finish my undergrad. Um, but yeah, no, that, that, about that time in 2007, when I was performing in Minneapolis, I was like, yep, this is, this is where I need to be. This is exactly what I need to be doing. And I have a voice and I have an opinion and I have something to say. And so, yeah, that's how I got here. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. And, yeah. you know, obviously today's theme, we're talking about creating safety and accessibility and inclusion. And Guy, you talked a little bit about your experiences and feeling, you know, obviously not like you belong somewhere. And so you want these creative spaces to be more inclusive. Um, I, I want to just throw it out there for anybody who wants to answer, but what does that look like? So safety, accessibility, and inclusion in these art spaces, in the art community. And what are you noticing are areas that can improve? 
I think um, for me, the core of it is communication. You know, example, what we're doing right now is starting a dialogue about, about what that means. But I think in our own little universes of music or theater or com comedy or, or spoken word and whatnot in our, as long as we need to start communicating more with each other. And so there's an understanding because as soon as that gets verbalized more and more, people are picking up on that. And then that just kind of becomes the norm um, of, of what that safety is or, or what the protocol would be if something should go down, you know, similar to like, um, Cullen's experience when he was in college with everybody go like everyone's panicking and it's like now I feel like we're all better understanding on what is going on when stuff like that happens and we're sharing information uh, more accurately I don't know if that's the what I'm trying to say but I think to to start the answer to your question I think communication is the is the foundation I, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, I, I've kind of been responsible for facilitating in the community is, is, is an open mic night. <clears throat> um, when, uh, I mean, that's how Clearwater Comedy was born, all of us meeting at an open mic together. And then uh, I got hired by the club where that open mic started about five years later to actually run and produce all of the events that were taking place there. And one of the main things that I instituted right away is like, look, what we see with open mic, and by that point we were at, it was like our fourth host person that we hired to host every week uh, was starting to peter out and their, their interest was waning. They weren't promoting it as much and the audience wasn't staying put. And, you know, from both a business and like an artistic point of view, I was just like, you know what, it's going to be way more work if I do this, but I think it'll make it better and we'll, take those waves down, you know? And I, I wanna consistently have, you know, like more people at the open mic over time, not have it be like, oh, new host, uh, uh, you know? And, and so one of the ways of doing that was having a rotating host every week. Uh, you know, you pay a different person to host it. And so it's my job to facilitate and find that person. Uh, they play for the first half hour and then help introduce all the artists, give them the power over that show. And in that way, you are giving new artists a chance to showcase themselves. You're giving them a quote unquote kind of professional job that maybe they hadn't had before uh, in the arts. And you get the benefit of having all these different people who are there to see specifically the host, stay and see other people and get to see more art in the Valley. And uh, that has been an absolute pleasure. And, you know, you know hiring people as, as Far and wide is Jerrica, one of the most uh, accomplished musicians that everybody loves in the Valley, down to a guy who I met who would, would come into the venue who was homeless. And he's like, hey, I have beats on my phone. Can I rap at this? I'm like, absolutely. You want to host? <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's, I mean, that's amazing. And having the opportunity to do stuff like that, I think it, it really does foster that communication that Jake was talking about. And it gives you that opportunity to showcase people that otherwise wouldn't have a chance to. I, I've, that was the best decision I ever made. <laughs> I'm really, really proud of that decision. I think it's made a huge impact. Yeah, Colin, I have loved that. Like, and I, what also I hear you saying is you, you, you're empowering these folks too to have a platform, which is you know something that so many of us had missed for so long. We didn't have a platform. We didn't have anything to share our work from or from something bigger than our own little space. Right. And like my show tunes from the womb kind of has that same uh, idea where I play music from folks who don't get played on traditional radio because it, it, for no good reason because every song I ever played I only played it because it was great so um I my touch on this would just be to add a little bit of what Colin is saying is just uh, giving sharing showing what other folks are doing that don't look like the typical you know Eau Claire resident walking around here um 
And I, if we can find way more ways of empowering too, not just sharing, but giving them a bigger platform, uplifting, that would be amazing as well. Eau Claire could use more of that. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah, my thought is just, it has to start somewhere and that it, it was, it's, it's something that I'm really, really happy that we get to do. And uh, it's moving to the Lakely. We're starting it at the Lakely here uh, in the middle of May, which is exciting. So. And I really love what you're both saying about like uplifting and then sharing, sharing platforms that we all have. Because I think for me, like what the most, like one, the beauty of open mics is that you don't know who's going to walk through the door. And I think that is so amazing. Like one time I went to an open mic and they did a high school musical mashup and it was the best thing I have ever heard in my life. I wish I could relive that moment. <laughs> um and it, you just never know the type of talent and the type of beauty that comes to the door and I think like the access piece is one of the most important parts when it comes to like how do we consume and also like engage with and be artists um and I think like that sharing piece and that community piece is most like really important I think about like as artists, we, and in a capitalistic society, we are always in competition with one another. We want to like take people's time and cons like be the type of person that people are consuming because that's where we get our worth from. And yet I have always found that like one communal open, night, open mic nights or a, it's a shared space where we can all showcase, write, create music, um, art, spoken word, poetry, all together, and then sharing it with one another in like confidence or in um, communal spaces, or having someone like host you or having um, the ability to showcase someone else's art other than your own can be so community building. And I think that is where like that comes from is not always like hoarding all of the attention. Although again, I do like attention on myself. And yet the beauty of community building is like, I share with you because in the long run, we are all here for the beauty of art and all showcases in such different ways in the same way that we are all in the space right here. Um, and so I think that is like, um, the areas of improvement are clearly like sharing platforms access. Um, and then also, um, like the, the unspoken yet, the spoken yet unspoken, like professionalism as well. Like this is what a production looks like. I think Jake, you talked earlier about like at the end of a show, it's always tied up in a neat bow, but that's not how life works. No. And that's like really, really amazing to see. Um, and that, and that's what I have. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. And uh, another thing that I would like to add, and just so we're not just like, saying, yay, look at the things we've done. I, I've, I've tried plenty of things that haven't worked. You know, we, we did a monthly uh, just spoken word and comedy event at the venue that I had uh, that we stopped doing after seven months. You know, we were only doing it monthly just because it was so lightly attended. I, I don't feel bad about that. We tried. Uh, we, we did writer's workshops. Uh, Clearwater Comedy did writer's workshops uh, in conjunction with volume one in their space. We did that for about six months then people stop going, look, we tried, you know? And it's, uh, art is hard and it's hard to find community and it's hard to uh, find those connections and keep building them. It has to, it's a fire that has to keep being fed. You know, you, you got, you, it's, it's hard, it's hard work and it's, it doesn't always work, but as long as we're still trying, I think that's important. I wanna to add too to this uh, mentorship, which, is, which can also yeah. build in with community building as well. I feel like as a baseball player, I was like, I legit was, I was a decent ball player, but I never had anyone who took me seriously enough to help me rise to any true real level. And then now I'm a musician and I still feel like I've been missing a mentor. And I feel like a lot of people, probably specifically queer folks um, and women don't have that access to a mentor. And I feel like uh, a mentorship program would be so cool uh, to help. And it doesn't just have to be an Eau Claire. I don't care. I'd love a mentor in some capacity. No matter what level we are and whatever art we're in, there's always somebody who could help us 
you know, and I think that would be incredible to help build community. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love that. Yeah. I'm not a panelist, but I just like my soul is like on fire as you all were talking about this. Uh, I too really appreciate the arts. I mean, that's like my number one thing with my platform is elevating artists and then more specifically the intersectionality of communities of color. So one of the things that I've been really intentional about in the last almost year at this point is when Ojusi opened, Hmong owned seafood restaurant, who would have ever thought that this place would be housing some of the best musicians, Hmong artists specifically, throwing huge shows at this point, but we really started out with just like, hey, do you want to like play at this venue? And I mean, Colin, I just have to give you a shout out because you had performed at my birthday party. Yep. And that was really what started uh, Xavier Yang, the owner, what started his movement of like, we need to bring more people here because not only is this venue cool as hell, but it's also just like a place where I can really contribute to the community and the Hmong community in such a special and unique way. And I mean, him and I speak a lot about how much we appreciate artists in general. And of course, art comes in many forms. So music is certainly one of the most like important things in my life. And so being able to like be a part of a movement in Eau Claire, housing incredible Hmong artists locally and also just like big names in, in our community and in the game, like, you know, it's insane that this is like where we're at and it hasn't even been a year. So can you imagine if yeah. everybody was just on board to doing more things like this, you know? And I guess I'm not trying to like toot my own horn either because I too know that only just a few years ago, I didn't even know where to start. I think I was, um, I obviously was consuming art, but I was not like brave enough to like be in a space like I am now where I could help, you know, facilitate conversations around like, hey, this is really important. And so um, I don't want to go on because this isn't about me, but it is also about me because <laughs> I'm just kidding, but it's really important well, to me and that's why I'm here. Yeah, yeah go yeah. for it, Jake. I was going to say, actually, though, that is really important because, um, as we're all doing what we're doing in the communities we're doing them in, it's really easy to, to get our head down and focus on a project. And this is what I'm doing. I'm writing an album, I'm directing a show, I'm putting on like, and you just get your blinders on and you've got your group with you. And I, speaking for myself, you know, I get so focused. If something's going on or wrong and somebody doesn't feel included, somebody doesn't feel safe and it's not brought to my attention right away or directly from them, sometimes I'm straight up honest, like I don't pick up on it. And then like, I just keep going through. And so conversations like this facilitated um, from people like yourself, um, are just a really great platforms and jumping off points for artists to go, oh yeah, okay. And like pick up another tool for the toolbox to like throw in and be like, okay, cool. Now I'm slowly getting this information into my head. And so therefore the next time something should come up, somebody is being, you know, is in harm's way and you like, I'll know what's going on now. So I challenge you and say you are relevant and this is very important. <laughs> Thank you. I actually was just fishing for just that exact comment. <laughs> uh, no, Sh Shane, can I tell you that um, I I've had plenty of uh, interactions with Xavier from O Juicy since that night. And uh, what I what I found out is that, oh, he doesn't need my help at all. He, he knows what he's doing. He He's he's amazing. They have like the best gear they have. They, they really like set up something amazing out there we, we did an open mic out there one time i don't know if you knew that but it was you know Sunday. i knew because i couldn't make it and i cried a lot oh. of salty <laughs> tears but yeah. yes i didn't know but but it was a sunday night uh in the middle of the winter and it was therefore lowly attended <laughs> you know it's like it's gonna yeah but um no he yeah what he's bringing to the community is is absolutely astoundingly wonderful i've been I've been watching it from afar and just been like so happy. It's just like, yay. <laughs> yeah, because um, did he get Kalia Universe yet? I don't know if he has. Has that happened? 
Um, so she was actually one of the first artists that came and visited the venue That's, yeah. with Chinchilla. Uh, Chinchilla yeah. is actually playing this weekend too, but that was when Kalia and Chinchilla, I think we're still dating. However, sure. Chinchilla, he's, he's, um, he's coming this weekend. He's got a show also, and yeah, he's got an entertainment company as well, but yeah. I mean, I guess one of the segue questions here and, and part of what I, you know, because this is all new to me was a lot of trial and error. Like I felt like when we first started, I was like, okay, well, I'll have Eric Hinch, you know, a white guy, pretty cool guy. He's one of my best friends. We'll have him in the lineup and maybe slowly introduce other forms of art. And I know there was like a huge, um, I shouldn't say huge, but there was some pushback with that because it was like, hey, this is where Hmong artists should feel safe. And Hmong patrons should feel safe. There's a lot of spaces already with white male artists that does what Eric does, right? And him and I had a very thorough conversation about it, but I booked him for that. Not to be malicious, obviously, but just to have like, you know, a, a little bit of transition between cultures and things. And so I guess for me, I, I took it as like, potentially I was causing harm to my own community. And so I really had to take a step back and reassess. And my question for you all is, um, has there been a time in your like career or maybe even just your life that you felt looking back that you've perpetuated or perpetrated harm um, in the arts community? And what did that look like? Can you share more about that? Open to anyone. Um, oh, Jake's got I'm going to jump right on that because it's, I'm going to jump right on that because it's Go for it. same idea of what you just um, shared with us. So um, we're doing, let me find my words here. True North with um, Volume One of the Pablo is is a night of storytelling, um, fostered through Volume One's um, story nights throughout. You know that they have once a month throughout the year, or whatever, in the art gallery. And then they enough people they've done them enough times where they've found kind of like the best ones, or they felt like we could bring those to life in some shape, way, or form. And so my job as a director was to work with each of the storytellers and, and to bring it to life in different ways. So we had dance and we had music and we had puppetry and we had photography, you know, it's like how, what's the best way to service the story? And we had um, Yia Lor, who is an Eau Claire um, Hmong woman uh, as a storyteller. And then we had Brooke Newmaster who is Korean um, participate and I was so focused on, I get just in my white man, Midwestern raising, like I just didn't think, didn't think to ask questions about, I mean, Brooke's story was about her father and it, and she was adopted. And so that, that was at the core and her and going back to Korea was kind of at the core of it all. Um, but Yia shared a story about her home and it being haunted and the experiences her family went through in that. Um, and they brought in a shaman to kind of deal with stuff. And I found out after the show was done um, through Brooke who became a very good friend of mine through that process um, that we didn't pay close enough attention to Yia's story and kind of the Hmong aspect was not so much included in how we physically represented the story. We chose to go with more of an animation style and using a local artist. And I thought it was great and it, it was fun. It was something different. We were do, doing, using this really great illustrator. Um, but in that excitement, it didn't occur to me to ask her more questions about her her heritage and how that how her story was rooted in that and what inclusion that had to that and so and I and she's a, she is a quiet woman um, and so she didn't speak up and so she shared it with Brooke who then shared it with me afterwards and I you know I felt gutted like oh my gosh like that obviously is not my intention um, but. So yeah, that was a time that I, I, I don't know if, well, I guess it's whatever your def definition of harm is. She was disappointed as the storyteller and as the artist and I didn't honor her the way she should have been in her story. Um, 
Which and that could now, speak a little bit to like the safety piece too, you know, like maybe she is vocal in a lot of spaces, but maybe she just didn't feel like emotionally well, safe and, in this. And that could have been it as well. And that is, and that is actually a very real thing as well that I, I talked with Brooke about. And again, it just wasn't thought about. Um, I was hired on after the storytellers were hired on. Um, but the production team that came out of the producing team that came out of volume one when we'd sit and meet with people it was four white dudes sitting at a table and that's hard <laughs> that's hard as a vulnerable artist of any color gender orientation just walk in and have that any a group of people waiting to critique you or judge you or give you feedback, but then to be a minority woman coming in with your art, of course, of, you know, like in hindsight, it's like, duh, of course. And I just was naive and just was again, so focused on piecing the show together and bringing the music and da, 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 that I didn't just stop and think. Yeah, and no. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot, obviously. No, 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 no. I, I, own, I think it just I, shows I we're all human, it. even if we're super no. intentional about what we want to create. Like, yeah. we're all human, we make mistakes. No, I, I, I look, I, I appreciate Jake being really honest and upfront about that sort of thing because, I mean, obviously it wasn't with intention, but unless you can admit, you know, hey, I could have done better here, nothing's ever going to change. If people yeah. are afraid to admit I could have done better here and have to immediately get defensive, that's how we get into these stupid traps of like, cancel culture nonsense right. yeah no I, I i own the fact that i i didn't and like i said i had several conversations with brooke afterwards and they were very enlightening and very enriching and i'm very thankful that she even felt comfortable sharing that with me and that could have been very easy for her to not even talk to me afterwards about that and be like well that experience is done moving on so i'm very appreciative of that and now i know no. Yeah, I had a moment, a time. I was the director of Oh Queer Film Festival. It's a queer film festival on campus. And I was the director of it like in 2013, I think. And at the time we had an employee who was pushing that we should uh, put trigger warnings on certain films that, um, you know, that would call for it. And trigger warnings were a new thing at the time. They were brand new to me. I had never heard of it. And I was thinking, I, cause I love film so much and I love the pure raw experience going in, not knowing what's going to happen. And uh, so I was pushing against this. I was like, no, I do not want trigger warnings. I don't want us to waste valuable paper space on our brochures to tell us trigger warnings. And I was, my mind was close to it because I, I personally um, haven't experienced any trauma sexually, um, you know, so I, I wasn't inside this person who was fighting for it. I hadn't understood their lived experience. And not to say that this person was particularly fighting for themselves, but clearly trigger warnings now as I've grown and matured and learned that I don't, I can't just look at a person and understand them, you know, duh. Um, I do understand the importance of trigger warnings now. And but uh, and I will say that we ended up using these trigger warnings too because, uh, well, I got outvoted and then I'm glad that it did inevitably happen because yes, trigger warnings are important. And I know that now, and I saw this question as part of it, I was like, I don't know. I always try to be inclusive. I always try to, be active. But when I heard your story, Shang, and then you, Jake, I was like, wait a minute, I did have a moment before I had evolved to this person I am right now, where I did make a mistake and I fought something that was not worth fighting. So I would say that would be something I did. And I'm glad I learned and I'm glad it played out like that. I'm glad I'm telling you my mistake. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I've certainly made mistakes with booking comedy shows too. Um, we, we have had we had a show that we had to cancel within four hours before it happened because we got an anonymous email from somebody saying that, hey, the person you have booked on this show sexually assaulted me. And so we had, we had to cancel the show, you know, um, and, but that was the right decision. Obviously that was the right decision. Uh, we have had people perform at, at our venue that later on 
uh, had been accused of horrible behavior. Um, and uh, yeah, it eats me up that that's happened. It's, um, but there's also the thing that, you know, the, in the broader scope of things, I mean, these, these are, you know, these things happen in our communities. Um, there are people like this everywhere in all walks of life, not just the arts. And uh, we, we have to, you know, be vigilant to just take care of each other. And when we learn these things, make the right decisions. You know, it's, uh, it's difficult and it's not always easy. I've had, I had to, I, and I, I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to talk about this. I guess I will. Um, there, there was a there was a person who started going to the open mics who I really really enjoyed. And one of the rules we have at the open mic rules, there are no rules, but one of the things that we've kind of decided as a collective, Clearwater Comedy, is like, hey, look, once somebody has a good five minutes, let's give them time on a professional show. We don't want to be gatekeepers and keep people away. Once they're ready to have a guest spot on a show, let's give it to them. You know. It, there's no like you have to be at this for six months or whatever it's just like you tell them once hey come back and do five minutes and if it's good and you're happy with it and we, we all like it you're on the next show you know that's that's kind of how we do things um you know so I, I gave a spot to this guy and then found out about like literal sexual assaults that they had committed and the, the and a person who had been close to the situation actually talked to me about it and 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 went over some of the details of it. And so this person who I just given the best news ever, I just say, look, there's redemption for you somewhere. I hope, I want everybody to be redeemed, but it's just not appropriate to put you on this stage. And I had to look them in the eye and say, I, I know I told you that you're gonna be performing next week. You're not anymore, I'm sorry. You know, that's a really tough conversation to have, but if we don't do that, we're not protecting our audience. We're not doing a, a good service to the people who, we want to come and see our shows. We have to do that. Just a side note too. I also think that really feed like tells you a lot about how like victim centered or survivor centered um, you are when you uplift um, and value the voices. I'm not saying valuing them over harm doers, but I'm saying like when you take someone's story and you are able to say, okay, in the realm of what I have the ability to do, one, what does what does accountability look like? Um, or not even accountability, because only the person who did the harm can really take accountability. But in your realm, like what would do justice to the victim and also like future vic like previous victims or like current victims of sexual assault or whatever that was too. And I think that like, I don't want to go on a tangent, but like how transformative justice comes into this is like how do we not like cut people off from communities and at the same time protect the individuals who have been harmed by people and so I think yeah. that is like the core part as well because we've talked a lot about a community and how that how important that is and then we've talked about like the concept of cancel culture and how like that can like really just spin people in and left and right when it comes to like oh, we're canceling this person left and right, but also protecting the people that we need to protect too. So I'll kind of be really brief about like the harm that I've done. But um, as a Hmong woman, I write extensively about how tr trash among um, patriarchy is and how what it means to live in this body and be told like you are an object ultimately. And I think like that has done a lot of harm when I have not like transformed my words in a way that tells the white gaze that this is not for you this is like this is not for your consumption and if you are there while like I'm delivering um that you are lucky one and two that um this story is not for you to take and say oh uh, oh my gosh Hmong culture is so backwards and that is my biggest fear and that's definitely come true so many times where people are like, oh my gosh, yeah, Hmong people are so backwards because they think this, this, and this because of the work that I have done. Um, and the hard part is that like, how do I even do that as an artist to talk about the things that I have experienced within the Hmong community and men in particular in my community and not do the whole, um, or not cater to the white gaze at the same time. Cause I've done that for a very, I did that for a long time too. Um, so like the, I think there's a quote that's like um, white, men saving 
um, BIPOC woman from BIPOC men and that concept that how like white patriarchy also plays into that too how um, white supremacy can really make when I guess how do I put it when Hmong women in particular talk about or BIPOC women in particular talk about the experiences that they have within their own communities um, white folks in particular take that up and eat it up as like I need to save these people from their own people and I think for a long time I catered to that and that was really harmful for the Hmong men in my community and I'm not saying one I harbor a lot of anger and a lot of like resentment towards like the men the Hmong men in my life who have done nothing when I have been berated and yet I also feel some strange way of like I need to keep that within myself um, and not let like white folks or like um, external folks hear about that. And so it's like a constant battle. And I think one of the parts of this question is like, what steps have you taken to like correct it? And I'm like, I don't even know what the right way to correct it is. I'm just um, messing around and finding out and experimenting at this point. Um, and I think that is like the beauty of also art. So have you, this is just a question for you. Have you written about that? like that juxtaposition and that struggle. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> Don't give me any ideas. I have deadlines right now. I need to. <laughs> I'm giving you ideas. I think, no, but I think that I, you know, I'm not familiar with your work, but I, I, that's a, sounds like a, just a gigantic struggle. And I think there could be a lot of um, beauty within exploring that for you as an artist. Uh, if what well, like you said you know whether or not you share it with the world but I think that could be really just interesting for you to to wrestle with if you want <laughs> if you like, want yeah, if you want you know. <laughs> I know just hearing you talk about it though that's so happy like I can't even imagine no I, I share Jake's I feeling it. there when, when I heard that I'm just like of course that's got to be a challenge because mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, if if by telling my truth in this situation it hurts my people, then what 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 truth was there? To, I get it. I get it. It makes sense. But I do think, and I just want to say from my point of view, also as among women, is that it's really valid everything that you're saying because those are your actual lived experiences and those are your thoughts and feelings. And you know, in some ways, you mentioned earlier that writing is a form of therapy, and if it helps you, and if you're sharing that with the world like that is beautiful. Um, but I also think there's another layer to this too, where um, I think we lost Colin there for a second. That threw me off. Um, no, I'm here. Just have the video off. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I think too, um, there's a lot of layers to this, you know? And so God, like what you were talking about is that white savior complex and that piece to things too, that makes things really complicated. And yet that should have very little influence or control on how we express ourselves. And yet realistically it does, right? Like, I mean, I'm just bringing this up as an example because it happened recently, but even the whole Will Smith thing mm -hmm. was insane. I, I don't speak on it because I don't have the lens of a black individual, you know, right. who's gone through a lot of those things. And so I don't, speak on that because I don't know anything about it. You know, I can analyze and read materials, which is what I did. But I mean, I know that sounds like a small example, but that was really huge. Like I've seen a lot of people feel really triggered by that, you know? And so I do think in some ways people have more of a valid lens to speak on it than others do. And I would say that for any marginalized group, like I would not be sitting here speaking about, you know, the LGBTQ community because I truly am not from that community, but I'm an ally of that. And so I would not speak from my lens trying to be like a savior. So, I mean, I just thought it was really great what you, there's just a lot of layers there. And I, I hope to unpack that with you separately one day, but um. So does anybody else want to add anything more with that question or do you want to go on to the next one? Well, I was just, I was going to pony off to what Colin had just said, which I just applaud him on that. I don't know if he's back now. Um, the fact that, you know, somebody reached out to him and said, hey, this performer, you know, has a history of assault and you canceled the show within four hours. And that's hard to do because, you know, especially in Eau Claire, which our community is, our arts community isn't huge. Our pool of audience members for any specific thing, depending on what it is, isn't huge. Um, our pockets aren't that deep. 
um, to produce shows. And so to, to make that call is really great um, and brave and good. I don't know if brave is the right word. That, um, that, that decision was just, just uh, to say the truth about it, that decision was made by other people in Clearwater Comedy. That was an okay. example. I, I didn't make that choice. But, well, well, the fact yeah. that the decision was made though, because it's I think it's just really very easy to say, well, yeah, but in these circumstances, you know, I think within the theater world, um, <laughs> A lot of times it's within our community, it's hard to get men actors, male dancers or whatever the show is. And so when I was younger, you know, years and years and years ago, there would, you know, you'd have kind of like the lecherous old man who was in the show and he'd be like, oh, don't change sides days because so-and-so is going to be watching you. And like, everyone just like knew that that was going on and just like, just don't do it. And it was because, well, we can't get rid of them because we don't have another guy to do that role. Like, it was just like, or how about ha talk to him? Maybe have him not do that. Like, don't, you know, so I just, I, I just think that's, we need to be, take a, be better at um, not doing the yeah buts, I guess is my point, is like make the call that needs to be called at the time that it needs to be called. I think uh, that actually transitions right to the next question that I had is, what is our obligation to, to the folks being directly harmed by these harm doers? I'm just going to call them harm doers. Um, and how do we respond to the people that are still consuming that art and supporting that artist? Um, we see it all the time, like in Hollywood, you know, during the Me Too movement, like, I mean, that's just one small example, but what is our obligation? Just going to throw that out. Um, recently that, oh, oh, I am not on mute. Okay. Recently, <laughs> I thought it was the Morgan, Morgan Whalen, that country singer who threw out his racial slur. Um, he was, you know, called out for his racial slur and, you know, maybe he was on the train to being canceled, but he ends up you know, selling more albums than anyone else that year, that he did this. And then just recently, he was invited back to play at the Grand Old Opry, which is a very important space for country artists and a space that they were finally getting more and more people of color in. So whereas they're just like opening the door to being more accepting, they allow Morgan Wh Whalen, I don't know how to sell, say his last name, and I'm not going to learn. Um, but they allowed him to sing on the stage. Uh, he guessed he was a guest singer, uh, singing with another dude. So the community was very, very upset. And what I, you know, I don't have a huge platform, but I do. So what I did is I just, every musician on my radio show that week was all women of color. And so, so when a person, I, I felt like I took it as, okay, this was a huge slap in the face of all these uh, people of color trying to get into the country world. Uh, when a place that's like the church of the country world is accepting a racist after they made promises that they were going to do better. So, you know, I'm going to just play all the music that they uh, are, you know, disqualifying by making that move. So that's just a little thing that I was able to do. And, and I plan to constantly do things like that throughout my life uh, whenever I see any kind of injustice like that. What can I do to put the scale in more of an equal spot? So. Can I just, um, I, I wanna follow on this, but I don't wanna speak too much. So I actually wanna ask you, Kat, like, what are your thoughts about what Jerrica just talked about? Like, so we obviously don't want to, what I'm hearing from all of you, so you don't want to go straight to cancel culture because there's still a level of redemption and for somebody to have the ability to learn and grow. Um, but we also know like realistically, if I'm comparing that, you know, it's not the same thing, but comparing that to Will Smith's even, right? Like how he's been banned now for 10 years. So I don't know, I guess I'm, I, I want to throw it to everybody, but to you guys uh, specifically, because you spoke a little bit about restorative justice and you know, that's something that I'm really passionate about and I'm still learning too as a student and how how like do you have thoughts about what Jerrica just spoke about yeah and I think 
I mean, not just what Jerrica has spoken about, but what everyone has yeah. kind of talked and dab- dabbled in about like what, I think the biggest question is like within the per- parameters of the society that we live in right now, I'm gonna get real technical a little bit, but like, can we even sustain um, like trying to repair harm in a restorative way? Um, and I think restorative justice falls under the realm of transformative justice and transformative justice is the concept that like, we need to completely eradicate the systems that punish people, period. And what I think, I think what Colin said is very also important too. Like within the realm that we exist in right now, let's use our imagination to see what it looks like when we are able to, I don't know if they have the power because that feels really weird and gross, but to like build communities, protect the people that have been harmed. And I think the piece that's like difficult to like consume, I would say is how do we see the humanity and people to take accountability for their mistakes? And what do we do as a community when that person will not take accountability? What does accountability look like? What does that look like? Not in the realm of like, oh, the victim has to forgive the person who harmed them. It, I mean, that is like an expectation that should not be had. Um, but also like, where do we see the humanity in the person that has done the harm? What has happened to them? And really centering the person who has been harmed. And so I think like, I'm thinking a lot of things, um, but also like transformative justice is the concept of like, we should stop punishing people. And also because punishment is like such a terrible word. And I think accountability is a really good word to use. Like, you know, maybe a victim wants like in, on, in Cullen's instance, like, I don't want this person to be on the show. And you're like, okay, we're not going to put him on our show. Um, and that's that. Um, or in Jerrica's way is just like, you know what, in my realm of what I have power over, this is what I'm going to do. And I think that is like the importance of community building, because when you build a strong community of, we are not going to tolerate this, the racists, the homophobes, the um, rapists are going to run the other way. Um, or they're going to come forward and say, I have done this. And when someone does that, how do we respond? if someone discloses to us, not that they were sexually assaulted, but when they are the person who has done that, the way that we respond to that is very definitive of how we see the humanity in others. And so I think like the hard thing is for me as an advocate, for me, it's like, I work specifically with survivors. I do not and cannot work with harm doers. And, but I also know in my extensive work that typically harm doers have been harmed in the past as well and that humanity piece is so important in that and centering the individuals who have been harmed it's a both and and it's so complicated and we do what we can with the powers that we have with the ability that we have in the realm and the the fingertips that we have how do we bring people together if they want to have that conversation which is a part of restorative justice of like we are bringing the harm doer and the person who has been harmed to have a conversation, to facilitate it. And if the victim doesn't wanna do that, and if the harm doer doesn't wanna take accountability, we also have to imagine what it looks like to create a community like that. And I say imagine because there is no like step one, two, three, four, five of how to do this. Um, and that's the beauty of transformative justice is like, there's no blueprint, there's no uh, rules or like, anything set in stone about what you're supposed to do. It's just, how do we stop punishing people for the mistakes that they make? So that was a long-winded answer, but yes. Yeah, it, it, but it, but there's so many good questions in there that are just so hard to answer. And uh, I mean, it, it, speaking to what you just were talking about there, Ka, the, the, uh, uh, in my professional capacity before not even involving comedy in any way, shape or form, when I was an employment counselor uh, for, for the homeless at a nonprofit in St. Paul, uh, I ended up working with a lot of ex-convicts, people who had been and served time for sex crimes. And uh, it was my job to not only find them work, but to help them keep that job. And, uh, you know, that is just such a small little chunk of life is work, but it's a very important one. 
And uh, I, I never would have turned somebody away because of the, 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 the nature of the crime that they were convicted of to help them find work. Um, when it comes to these spaces uh, where we're, we're making and performing art, it's full transparency in, these, in this regard is just one small step. I mean, uh, it's so, so hard, but like it's the, when it comes to like being a part of like an arts community and, and, and when I'm trying to say what I want to say in a good way and I'm not going to say it well. Hey, uh, take it away, Ka. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Uh, what am I trying to say? What am I trying to say? That that maybe that's not the right space. I I, I don't. And, and I don't know. Like, it, it just feels safer to me to like make sure that like look if if there's people like that in the community, we we have to just like say okay, well you just can't be on the stage. It, it just feels like the safest decision to me. I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm hearing what you're saying because there's a lot of yeah. pieces to this puzzle, right? Yeah. So like part of what you're, what I'm hearing you say is that your responsibility and obligation is that you are holding, you're protecting the victim while trying to still hold that harm doer accountable. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're seeing would be your obligation. The larger pieces to like the transformative restorative justice yeah. is a community Right. Like responsibility. I, I guess this is the what I was trying. Yes, that that's exactly it. And <laughs> I, I guess in, in, in my head, there's a difference between an open mic and a professional show. I guess I wouldn't stop somebody from performing on an open mic, but I wouldn't hire them to be on a professional show with those accusations. Does that make sense? I don't know. I don't even know if that's the right thing to do, but that's there is a distinction there to me. I don't know. Does that make sense? I mean, if somebody's yeah. behaving poorly at an open mic, I'm not going to let them be on the stage. Their, their activity and behavior there would preclude that. But and I also think you're speaking to like the one, the intricacies and the really ickiness when it comes to like transformative justice. Yeah. And you're speaking to like, this is not an individual effort. Like we all play roles in the revolution. That's my, you know, I think we all do. And I think like we all play different roles when it comes to like how, what platform are we giving to individuals who have done harm? I think that is also a question. Like, um, yeah. are we giving them a platform to do more harm? That's the question. Are we giving them a platform to take accountability though? Yeah. Um, and do they even want to take accountability? And if they right. don't, like that's really where you as an individual and a community like can be like, we're going to de-platform this person because <clears throat> they're going to go on stage and harm someone or they're going to write pieces that harm someone. Um, and I think that is like a key piece of what you're talking about too. You're like, I'm one person, what can I do? Um, yeah. And this is the part where we all like band together and like change the world, you know, um, in our own ways. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're talking directly about the like, difficulties of transformative justice because all we have ever known is like yep let's just get rid of the harm um and then where does the harm go then like yeah what? exactly where does it go yeah and, and i but, think too it speaks to like defining what harm is like what somebody thinks is harmful to them may not be it might actually be therapeutic to somebody else so that's just especially in the arts world when you're wanting to be creative and have a, a safe space to showcase whatever it is that you're wanting to showcase that you've created yeah. it could be harmful to others like Jerica's example of like others might hear some of this content and feel it's very graphic and not resonate with it versus somebody else who sees it in a different light. And so that definition of harm could also look differently for people too. But sorry, Colin, you're- No, you're no, speaking. look, I, I, I think what I'm trying to get at the root at is that, look, I, I, there doesn't seem to be a perfect solution. That's the best option just to avoid it like as much as possible. But I, I, I'm coming from a place right now where I know there's probably mistakes that I have made that I'm not even aware of. And there are more mistakes I'm going to make later on. And um, it, it's being honest and confronting and admitting them when they happen. And, uh, you know, 
just holding holding each other accountable. And I mean, I, I guess with Clearwater Comedy, it, it's I end up being like the spokesperson for it a lot and stuff like that, simply because I'm the oldest person in the group. But we really do kind of make the sessions together. And I think that's a way to kind of mitigate power structures and eliminate uh, gatekeeping and uh, things like that is just like by doing things collectively, working together. You know, I, that's that's another way to kind of help the situation. Jake or Jerrica, did you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Well, I don't know if it's really on topic, but I, as I'm sitting here listening, um, it's just really excellent stuff that is posing even more questions and more and da 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 um, beyond my realm of you know experience. Um, I think what's really important too is specifically for me, you know, being a director, usually I'm the head of the show. So everyone's looking at me like, what's next? Like, okay, this is happening. Now what? Um, that I think it's, I, I guess I'm saying this out loud to remind myself. Um, it's okay for me, for someone to say, we're going to stop. I need to figure some stuff out before a hand down a decision. Um, you know, I think that we just, it comes to a head so quick, you know, when, if something should happen, someone's in harm, if there is like a sexual assault of something or, you know, somebody's put in harm's way and it's like, we need an answer now. What are you going to do to this person? Now. And it's like, I, uh, I just found out about it and you're all sitting here looking at me and uh, we're going to do this. And it's like, I, you know, I think it's really important to be like, we're going to stop. I got to ask some questions of the people involved, but I think also more importantly too, ask questions of people who work in those spaces, who have that headspace. You know, like to call someone like Amanda or Ka, or and be like, "Hey, this is the situation I have. I am in over my head. Like, just I don't. I'm not even looking for an answer. I just need thoughts. I need thoughtful." feedback because obviously there's going to be questions i'm not even thinking about or scenarios i'm not even thinking about so i think going back to my original answer at the top of this communication mm -hmm. i really love the concept of transformative justice i've heard of restorative justice but transformative justice is new to me guy i think you're the one that's introducing it I love that idea of the, is it, is it kind of the idea that the community is coming together? Yeah, so like I, it's, it's, I was just going to say, oh, sorry, Kai, Fiona to define some of that. I, I'm just still learning a lot about it too, but, uh, but yeah, Kai, maybe I'll have you speak on it. Um, I like really the, the, the crux of transformative justice is like, we need to get rid of systems of harm, AKA incarcerate like prisons. Mm -hmm. so we see it's more than just uh, like rehabilitation and redemption it's like yeah. more it's like a larger picture kind of coming together to like reduce harm and prevent harm really yeah it's like a prevention response and like education on like harm in general so like getting rid of systems that force people ultimately force people into um like psychiatric wards or like nursing homes even or prisons like, or prisons and so these are all things that like um, harm people and also these places create harm as well mm -hmm. um, where we put people who have harmed and also be, create harm in the process because we don't believe that individuals who have been imprisoned are worthy of uh, like living ultimately when we right like you're stripping away them of their basic human rights and that they they themselves deserve empathy as well because they are humans too so it's very complex, but yeah, I'm learning a lot more about it. And it's just been something that has changed my life a lot, actually. So, so it's not, it's not talking about changing a person. It's talking about changing an establishment. It's systems, it's the, the systems, larger picture stuff. So is restorative justice more um, focusing on the individual then? Situation. So like that, this is kind of how I was told about it. And I, I did not, I did not define this, um, but 
So I've been working with Jason Soul. He was actually on my show too, not trying to plug my show, but he was on my show as well. And he is a self, uh, like he proclaims himself to be an abolitionist. Whereas before, you know, abolition is always tied to like, historically has been tied to slavery, which it is still tied to systems that enslave people, right? And so one of the things too that he speaks about is the differences between criminal justice, that's his background. So he's ex-incarcerated and then um, he learned a lot through his um, experience being like incarcerated, like all the different systems of harm that was caused onto him when he was himself a product of trauma, which caused harm. So this perpetuating of harm, right? And so criminal justice essentially says, hey, you caused harm. We're going to hold you accountable in the legal system. Whoever has the best lawyer technically is probably going to have the best outcome. Um, then we go into like different, you know, institutions of racism and all these other things. Okay. Restorative justice, like, hey, I caused, uh, you know, or this person caused me harm. There needs to be some sort of coming together of like, hey, I caused you harm because I robbed your house. And now, you know, you have PTSD because of feeling unsafe at night or whatever that looks like. So I want to redeem myself in that. And both those individuals and that situation comes and has some of that restorative justice piece where it's beyond the legal system, you know, and it takes a lot of work. This is why it's really difficult in a community to to bring this together because it's it's really a holistic kind of way of handling things. So that would be more of like a, a response, right? Like after harm was completed, um, then transformative justice, like how do we come together so we can not have this happen? How can we prevent this from occurring? And so if let's say in that example, and this is a very simplified way of, of talking about it because we all know situations are very complex, people are very complex, but in this, context this this individual jason let's say you know he had been a product of harm and i'm not trying to minimize the story at all i mean he's written books he's a professor he's incredible um there's a lot of work out there but you know he was a product of trauma and harm and where did that go you know that was let's say his parents or whomever it was that harmed him they were a product of harm right and so in that context it's like how do we come together as a community to end that violence and that cycle of harm. So that is that transformative piece, which takes even more work as a community. Um, and it's a lot of flipping institutions upside down, which is very difficult work. So anyway, I didn't mean to go off a tangent, but I'm just very passionate about it as well. So yeah, I love that. Like, I want to see our community to do more of that. And I'm thinking too of the individual, the person who gets canceled, but along the lines of this restorative ju transformative justice like there was an old uh this was years ago on facebook was newer um a picture going around it was an indigenous tribe an old way of dealing with people who are have wronged they would circle around this person and remind the person of the good in them and that was their way of punishing but it was more of you are a good person and remember this and it was community based and yes i doubt that's something that we could establish in our society because don't doubt that because it. abolition work actually falls okay. in alignment with a yeah. lot of that a lot of the native practices of coming together as community holding people accountable but helping them heal exactly. that is huge in abolition and transformative yes. restorative justice work so that, that is not off base at all in fact like that is one of the core values and tenets that we you know really try and, and focus on is like just there's a lot of people that can't call and sorry this is taking a tangent now but there's a lot of people that can't call on the police or call on, on people or have access to resources, if they're low income, if they're LGBTQ, they can't always go to somebody and feel safe. If they are a Hmong person, if they're a black person, there's a lot of institutions that people, that's why you know a lot of these groups are marginalized groups because they don't receive and are able to accept help the same way. So they've come up with different systems that's gonna be healing and restorative. And so that, that actually, I don't mean to go off a tangent, but yeah, that is essentially not, that's not far off from what I think we should be looking at as a community. So All right. that's my personal opinion. Uh, Jerrica, have you ever seen the film? I guess everybody, have you seen the film, The Painter and the Thief? It's a documentary. No. Okay. Uh, it's You're gonna documentary. reenact it. 
No, no, but it's it's He's a got costume. puppets. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's uh, it's a it's a documentary about a like a woman whose painting was stolen from her, and then she she makes friends with the guy who stole it, and it takes place over the course of years. It's amazing. It's beautiful. I cried three times. Watch it. I'm writing it down right now. The, the painter, painter and the thief, everybody. Yep. Yep. So I know we're really like running short on time here because I spoke like quite more than I should have. But uh, I think what I, I before we end this, um, one of the last things here that I wanted to just throw out to everyone and anybody can answer first is um, what are the most important steps that we can do, whether it's the Hmong community, Eau Claire community, arts community, LGBTQIA plus community, whatever community you feel that you belong to or could represent, what do you think that either you could do or a call of action that any of our viewers and listeners are, you know, are able to do to cultivate safe and supportive spaces? Um, I, I think just being enthusiastic and um, committed to high quality and engagement, the, the more of us involved, the more we hold each other accountable. Uh, you know, keep it out of the hands of uh, gatekeepers and uh, people with a vested interest in maintaining power rather than creating something. Uh, I think I think that's that's what's going to be the best. There will be mistakes. There will be. Uh, bad things that happen, but when that happens, we come together and we we make the best decisions we can. And uh, I think that's it. Just uh, really thinking about it as a community, like what's the what what should we do that's best for everybody? Without you, you know, and and I think I talked my way out of a good quote. I think I just kept going when I should have stopped. And sometimes that but happens. Now it's you, and you're adorable. <laughs> it's your birthday. Oh, stop! You're allowed to do it. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, that's. I, I think that's it. Just knowing that it's never going to be perfect. But if we hold each other accountable, and we we think and act together, we can make beautiful things. I love that. I I agree, and I would also say let's have more of those open, safe, inclusive events, just yep. having more and hope, you know, how do we make more people to show up sharing it? I would just add that just having those events, Cullen, what you have done with the, uh, you know, I feel like you would always create and set the boundaries at the beginning of every comedy show. And I think that's a really good way too. So the audience knows what to expect. And if they fall outside of the boundaries you safely, those safe boundaries you put, then they get, they have to be held accountable for it. Yep. And I love yeah. how you always have yeah. done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Jerrica for a lot during the years, more than uh, Jake or Cobb. But um, it, the hope is to, you know, eventually with Converge Radio, be doing like two shows a month. That, that's, I want to get to there by the end of the year. Now that COVID's gone, I think we can, or <laughs> gone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> COVID uh, completely yeah. done, it's canceled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, just uh, weekly, just open mics, live events, where you're being intentional with your booking, where you're trying to book uh, from all different backgrounds that we're, we're talking sexual orientation, race, gender, age, even. I think that's one thing that people forget about. There's some pretty amazing people in their 60s playing music in this city. And, you know, what we should tell 20 year olds, look, these people have been doing this a long time. You should come see this, you know, and and that that's the thing that you have to talk to, you know, some of the more established artists about, like, look, build your audience. you got to Go to open mic every now and then. Show them who you are. They don't know, you know. Um, yeah, and 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 telling sixty-year-olds you got to see this new twenty-year-old who plays guitar. They're amazing. You know, you you have having those conversations together and being intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep booking uh, as as diverse lineups as I can because those are the most entertaining lineups to book. There, there's, I, I don't, I don't even think I think it's doing a service to the community. Yes, but it's also just way more fun it's way better it makes it better it does so you'll book me colin i'll book you i'll book you 
Yep. Well, I think though, going off of what you just said though, I think as the world is opening up more, our community is opening up more, there's gonna be more live stuff happening. We have, yes, the last two years have sucked with COVID and everything that goes along with it. But we have just, a, I think a really unique moment to think differently with how we do it all and just whatever it is use COVID as the excuse of like no we're doing it different like so we're like status quo be gone like let's we're gonna do it this new way whether it literally has anything to do with COVID at all <laughs> <laughs> like you just use that as the, the scapegoat but like no we're I mean, just because I but you know I say that jokingly but everybody is already just their brains are already just thinking in a different way and receiving things in such different ways now. And we're used to receiving in different ways now, kind of for the most part, um, yeah, that, that I, could be a huge act to us. I, I, I think I think you're right about that. And, and it is something that I've seen just in the little bit of shows we've had coming back. It does feel like the audience is more engaged and thinks of themselves more a part of it when they're there. You know, I, I think, think it has like, done that. We appreciate art so much exactly. more. We didn't exactly. have it for we so appreciate. long. Exactly. We appreciate being together so much. It, it becomes more about the togetherness. Red, sitting back with your arms crossed. All right, entertain me. Come on, do it. No, you're there and you're a part of it. Yeah. I'm so hurt that you spoke about me like that. <laughs> um, I think going going back to your question though, Shang, I think we the responsibility falls on us to speak up, to be vocal. Um, even when maybe we're tired, maybe we don't wanna, maybe we don't, you know, like whatever the scenario is, um, there can be a huge payoff and a huge reward for just that two seconds of reminding people verbally, like, nope, this is, you're wrong, or this is what it needs to be. And I think also just you know, at the beginning of your question, you state, sorry, I'm in my window right now because of the good lighting. And there is just insane amount of birds right now. So my eyes keep being caught. Um, um, like those weird videos where they're like moving on mass and like making shit. Yeah. Everyone who knows me knows I'm so afraid of birds. So I'm oh, not don't sit jealous of where you're sitting right now. Um, no, but I think, you know, you had said like, whether it be the monk community or the LGBTQIA community or whatever, like as I think we all need to show up for each other as well and make sure we're, have, whether, you know, I don't want to be like, I'm gonna show up and say something loud and proud about the monk community because I don't know what I'm talking about, but I can be present and I can have your back and I can, you know, visually be supportive in that way as well too. And I think we need to continue doing that. I saw, you know, we saw a lot of that with after George Floyd um, with BLM stuff here in, in, in like that summer was to me really, I don't wanna say wonderful because obviously not wonderful, um, but the amount of stuff happening within Eau Claire and the community and the showing up and the protesting and the people getting loud and, and all the different communities supporting and showing up and um, yeah, build off that, that momentum as well. So I think it's really huge. Yeah, and I like building off of what you just said too, like I think an important part of like just being a human in general is like showing up when no one else is watching like showing up not like physically showing up but when people are not looking at you what are you doing like how do you stand how do you what are your views when you are also really uncomfortable and I know we didn't get to this question but it's like my favorite question um is like the politics part of it like so often we are told not to engage in <laughs> politics and be apolitical when in reality art has always been political um, the people who have created art have always engaged in politics. Our existence, for the most part, has been political. And it's like, I think that is the part. Like, what do we do when we are uncomfortable? Do we go home and be comfort, like, be comfortable? Or are we uncomfortable? And are we thinking about, what does transformative justice look like? Like, that makes me really uncomfortable because I'm a control freak and I need step-by-step -step of what, what transformative justice is. And that is not what it is. And I think that, like, are you willing, are we willing to be dis, like, discomforted? Is that a word? Uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, that's a word. <laughs> I'm a writer, I swear. Um, and like, how do we create the conditions where people see themselves reflected and therefore like we plant a seed and they're like, 
I can do that too. I think mm-hmm. it's like the very, very core of like the purpose, why I think I'm put on this earth and why I create. And I think if we can do that, I think we have succeeded when it comes to art. And so yeah. like, that, I think is what we can do to create safer communities um, and more supportive communities when it comes to diversity within our area. So. Yeah. And, lo- and look, we have to do that work first before we can really say as a community, look, we can all, we can all see ourselves and other people. You know, that's ultimately the goal, but like representation does matter. And, and you have to, and you have to be thinking that that's your responsibility because you have responsibility to your community to tell the truth. Tell your truth. Well, yeah, well, share, yeah, let, give a space for everyone to tell their truth. Yeah. 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 I've loved this every second of it. <laughs> I've learned yeah. so much. Me I too. love that. God, you're so smart. I know. I just like you. I, you're I the way you're Can we be friends? <laughs> I realize I, I, we're recording again, like for the next oh, 12 hours. And we yeah, can just uh, continue Ka, speaking yeah. about all these. Uh, Ka, Ka, I actually muted at one point and just turned to a man and I said, Yeah, you were right. I like her a lot. <laughs> 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 I'm sitting here, like, so two things. Um, yes, Jerrica, 100%, like the way Ka's brain works. I just like, love it <laughs> but if the way my screens are are stacked right now she's right above sheng and so when sheng was talking and then cause muted but she's doing all these physical stuff above it's hysterical like just <laughs> those two screens have, have been bringing me great joy yes <laughs> well i really appreciated the conversation and honestly like to amanda to yuka like to the family support center for bringing us all together to just I never thought that uh, we could be so much closer than we are already, Colin, and everybody else on screen. But I feel like this has been such a genuine- We've cried together. We've cried together before, baby. No, hold on. I cried. You watched me. (laughs) (laughs) I think I cried too, friend. But okay. Colin always cries. He probably had a tear too. (laughs) (laughs) Crying is healthy. Um, Jake's play made me cry. Holy crap. I was like sobbing. Which one? Which one? (laughs) <laughs> we're gonna need to do so much more creative uh, stuff together yeah. now yeah. like i'm gonna i'm gonna be singing next to jerica you know doing slam poetry <laughs> next to god like i don't know oh. we're gonna be doing a bunch of creative stuff together and we're just gonna blame it on covid you know just say it because of covid um but i i super sincerely appreciate everybody coming and having this conversation and again thank you to the family support center and to god and to amanda and to everyone who put this on thank you all yes, so much thank you